film is really about thinking your way through around all kinds of obstacles and problems. Work the problem. I do love that it celebrates intelligence and that spirit of, of courage that these guys really have, these astronauts who do this. There's an inherent human instinct to explore, and so space travel is just the next thing to explore. This novel is somehow this sort of love letter to humanity, so that every choice the characters make are choices that any human being would make faced with the dilemmas that they're faced with. But it's kind of the best version of who each of us is. It's not science fiction. It's as near fact as it could possibly be. So the challenges are reality, not fantasy. Commander, I can't let you go through with this. This is a script developed inside Fox Studios. It was from a great book by Andy Weir called The Martian. My whole life I've been into uh, the space program, manned and unmanned space flight. And I was sitting around one day thinking, okay, how could we do a manned mission to Mars with our current technology? How do we get the astronauts there? How do we make sure they survive? How do we get them home? But then I thought, okay, well, uh, any mission plan needs to account for failures. What if this thing breaks? What if that thing breaks? What if these two things both break? How do we make sure the crew doesn't die? And I realized that these scenarios are starting to sound like an interesting story. So I made one unfortunate protagonist and subjected him to all of them. Drew Goddard, who wrote the script, was going to direct the movie, and I, I read it, and I just thought the script was such a great kind of original story, and there aren't a lot of original stories getting made nowadays into films. I hadn't read the book. I hadn't, um, I'd missed it when it kind of came out and caused this little sensation. People recommended it to each other. It got really high ratings on Amazon, and it sold really well, and that got the attention of Random House, and then they offered me a print deal. And then around the same time, Fox came for the movie rights. And the print deal and the film rights deal were agreed to four days apart. It's a pretty big deal that 20th Century Fox wants to make your, uh, you know, at least option your book and talk about making it into a movie. I don't think he really believed me. I mean, I thought he's like, oh, okay, great. I'm like, sure, <laughs> go for it. And yeah, I was, I was slightly worried a little bit about how they might make a movie and what they might change and stuff. But I figured, well, we'll just see what happens. A week later, I told him, so, uh, you know, about that book, well, we got maybe the most in-demand screenwriter, Drew Goddard, uh, interested in wanting to adapt this, and he loves your book, and he basically wants to do your book with very few changes. Any concerns I might have had about the film, you know, violating the book in some way, pretty much went away when I was talking to Drew, before he even wrote the screenplay, because it was clear he wanted to follow the book very closely, and he cared a lot about the things I cared about. Most notably, he cared a lot about the scientific accuracy. We started the process of budgeting the movie and, and sort of softly prepping the film. And then Drew had an opportunity to go direct, at the time he believed, a Spider-Man movie. And so all of a sudden we had an amazing screenplay. Matt had already said that he wanted to do it. We just needed to find, as we like to say, we wanted to find a Ridley Scott type. But of course, Ridley was busy at that time because he was gonna make Prometheus 2 and then very fortunately, his schedule changed. We got him the script on a Friday, and you know, by Saturday, he was in. Then uh, I got a call that Ridley Scott wanted to direct it, so obviously that was the end of my deliberations. <laughs> he said to me the first time we met, he was like, why aren't we doing this? This is gonna be fun, you know? And I was like, sold. I was just sent it by Fox. Good scripts don't land on your desk very often, and that's why I always develop everything. So I read The Martian, and uh, it was kind of slam dunk. I read it, I think, four hours and went, I'll do it. <laughs> um, it's such a good script, uh, that, and it's based on a very good book, but the writer very respectfully adapted the, you know, the script from the book. This movie has been the most blessed process from the very beginning. From reading the book and loving the book, the studio immediately saying yes, us getting the number one, our number one pick for the writer, getting the greatest science fiction director arguably of all time, getting the perfect actor to play the part and all these other amazing actors to play their parts. 
there's something I believe intrinsic to whether it's the voice or the idea or the spirit of Andy's novel that, that, that galvanizes people, that gets people to say yes. This is an adaptation of the book that's very true to it. Um, it has all of its humor, all of its strange, almost ethereal lightness of this character stuck on a planet on his own. The ultimate survival is always fascinating, particularly when it's real. What do you do when the end of the world happens? Because if you shipwreck, the end of the world's happened. I think that was what kind of he connected to, that story of uh, survival. And he'd always wanted to do Robinson Crusoe, and I think this was an interesting spin on it for him. I didn't want to focus too much on deep psychological issues or anything like that. I wanted it to be all about the problem solving. And so by doing that, that means that I need to accurately present the problems. I think people are fascinated by science when it's showed. So I think the energy of what you're learning as you go is pretty, pretty cool. That's where the humor came in, because if you're gonna, if you're gonna give somebody a big, long scientific exposition, you have to put jokes in there to break it up and make them want to keep reading and also make the information stick in their mind. So that's why I made Mark such a smartass. Well, that and I'm a smartass. How the hell could you leave me on Mars? The biggest challenge was how do we capture that voice in what are essentially one-man scenes um, without resorting to voiceover or things that are a little bit more literary and not cinematic? How do we make those scenes of Mark by himself in a relatively small set of the Hab Cinematic. I'm gonna put 50 GoPros everywhere in this hut, in the loo, in the kitchen, in the laboratory. The GoPro becomes like the black box of the habitat. The GoPro becomes a companion. We've had a complete open door relationship with NASA with an exchange of they want to know what we're doing. They've been helping us that we don't design things that are not correct or not where they think it may be going for the first mission to Mars. So we've had a very free exchange of ideas. Annie's book has a lot of fantastic interactions that go on. You know, the personal tensions, the, the opinions, the, the things that aren't science that we deal with every day really ring true. Also, Andy worked very hard to get the science right. Now, it's not perfect, it's science fiction, and uh, that's what I dearly love about it, but I think that it gives us a fabulous opportunity to tell the public what that environment actually might be like as astronauts end up on Mars in the 2030s or 2040s. There is probably nothing grander in the human imagination than space travel. I mean, the distances are so vast, you're seeing, you know, landscapes that don't exist in your day-to-day -day reality, but at the same time, you know that they actually exist. So there's a sense of wonder that I think people feel about space travel that, you know, can capture their spirit. The backbone of the movie is the impossibility of his task. And you can't do this without team effort. People who are playing the other side of the coin, i.e. on Earth at NASA and JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, it's a massive team effort to actually, A, get it up there, and B, then discover you've got something, big problem, and therefore what you've got to do is come together and actually get this man back down. You know, when I was at JPL, they showed me um, what happened when they landed the Curiosity rover. That's seven minutes where you don't know what's going to happen. There's no people involved. It's just a robot. But it is the continuation of the human species. It's traveling beyond what we thought was possible. By the end of the story, I was just very touched by uh, the humanity of it. Uh, that, uh, that really, at its essence, it's a, a very detailed look at uh, an entire community rallying. Uh, to utilize every last piece of energy, equipment, thought, you know, finance that they have to, um, to save a single human life. He represents, I think, something more than just one life. He represents, you know, everybody's hope and, and that kind of pioneering instinct that, that human beings have to, to, to go further, to plant our flag a little further, to protect ourselves ultimately. 
part of what the book does and what we really want to do with the movie is honor what NASA's done and what they could do. The optimism, the hopes, the aspirational quality, the courage that NASA represents, that it galvanizes people in a way that everybody together was watching the first man on the moon. There was no sense of race or gender or even nationality. And the hope with this movie is it will remind people that if the world does sort of bond together, it can do greater things than when it's divided. Guys, that's me. Lucky we keep each other. Be That's the weirdest line I've ever had to say in a movie. Sorry, man. You were like three, two, one, bro. What happened to that? Okay, sorry. That's... He said sorry. two, three, bomb. Here we go. <laughs> Can I... Wait, what is Stand the count? Three, two, one. Yes. Three, two, one, okay. go. Yes. Three, two, one, boom. Okay. He started, he started at two, one. <laughs> me. Okay, ready and boom. <laughs> Here we go. Ready. Can you do that one? <laughs> Through the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> the Martian. <Sorry. laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay, boys. And we're set. Uh, okay, Wait, let's what? ask the 200 million. <laughs> I'm sorry, 500. That's a five? At least. One second. Sorry, I think I pressed something. <laughs> sorry about that. Are you suggesting we don't do the camera? Are you Please. suggesting we don't? <laughs> Let's ask the very, very expensive question. <laughs> Holy! <laughs> Holy! <laughs> Not their head off! Oh! Lewis is dead! <laughs> I'll keep you on to this. Oh my God! <laughs> okay, we are rolling. Scissors. <laughs> 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 Is this them? Ah, I got him. Never mind. Hold on. Let's go. Let's go. No, no, I got him. I got him. Actor error. I need more coffee. Are you? Are you okay, man? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> How'd that look? <laughs> That guy took the stapler when he left. We just we only have one, so I Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna cut there, man. That's not a good shot of my ass. <laughs> no. Let's let's get a grip. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> this is just um, this is potato porn. <laughs> <laughs> Both plans require the tying shim. So we have to choose. That's my line, I think. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we said that again. I don't know what that means. Sorry. <laughs> and look! Cheers! Oh. Pizza? I'm starving. 
Vincent, why wasn't this addressed in the inspections phase? We were forced to launch our uh, we were forced to launch our window, and then we stopped. What you skipped the inspections phase? Yes. <clears throat> wow. Unbelievable. Not even close to what was in the script. Um, let's try it again. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good. So what now? What are you going to do now? Well, we start again. I don't know. <laughs> but we used to have a beer. <laughs> Did the president know I was here with you guys? It's not important. <laughs> <laughs> let's clean that up, let's go again, please. Sorry, guys. I guess it doesn't look great if I crawl in there. Well, the goals are exactly the same. This time we hope to bring all the astronauts back alive. Well, we did bring them back alive, but... <laughs> One of them was in a bad mood. <laughs> this time, of course, we hope to bring all the astronauts back at the same time. Um... That, that was a funny. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How about that? 533 days before we see our families again. 533 days of unplanned. <laughs> Matt? Families again. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> Johansson, can you turn on those lights? <laughs> <laughs> I went to forklift school, I'm telling you. Right away I'm going left? No, I'm going kind of straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going straight. Okay. Right. Not to the left here. Trying to avoid these plants. <laughs> you, you gave me a rough route, Ridley. <laughs> well, that's our producer. I probably shouldn't hit him. We are now going to attempt to finish it in 28. Okay, we're going to start with the hyperbolic departure. And the altitude is uh, 10.79. Raise it by one degree. <laughs> I can't buckle my seatbelt. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to cut this all up. It's going to be great. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's a fel- It's when someone use with or without a straw. Okay. Sucks the out of a or an after a or So the way you usually do casting for a movie is you make a long list, you kind of put it in order, you really want the person on the top of the list, but you know you're going to get like the seventh or eighth person on the list. Each time we've gone after our sort of impossible dream, it's almost like we just go to them so that to get a no, so we can go to the people who are more realistic. They've said yes. That's the way it was with the, the entire cast, top to bottom. The biggest thing that any director can do is cast properly. You cast properly, you know, a large portion of your work is done on that particular day, because particularly this film, which is monumentally complex in all its bits and bobs, as a jigsaw puzzle, um, I rely on my actors as, as a good team. I think Ridley got his first choice for every single role. It's a mixed blessing with this movie, because I have so many scenes by myself. It's nice to know that these like world-class actors are, are, are in the film. I just wish I had more <laughs> scenes with them. Jeez, that was close. <laughs> Matt Damon, fortunately, is kind of somewhat of a dry comic. He's funnier than hell. And sometimes we've got to rein in and say, listen, you're meant to be terrified, or you're meant to be afraid. This particular confluence of characteristics, that sort of humanity and intelligence and humor, I can't imagine, and we couldn't really have imagined anyone else playing it. It's a very unique role. Like, I really thought about it, you know, as when I first read it, I went, wow, this is, I hope the audience wants to hang in there with me. Good, guys. 
my thought always was, I think it was particularly portrayed in, in the, the right stuff. In fact, the very term right stuff means that you've got the right stuff inside you not to panic. So they do not allow fear in to the equation. So I think I, from Mark Watney's point of view, he doesn't allow fear in. Sometimes it wells up and comes at him and then he pushes it back. I do really like the character. I, I love his ingenuity and, and I love the idea that the movie celebrates. As Drew said, he said it's a love letter to science. You're in Martinez's hands now. Jessica Chastain is Captain Lewis of the Hermes, probably naval, originally pilot, and then evolved to becoming astronaut. So that will give you a trick into this is what we're going to do is this, because they can't hear. Does that help? Jessica Chastain, I always thought she's very interesting anyways, so I was lucky to get her. I found in my research a lot of women that are leaders in politics or in military backgrounds. They present themselves not emotional and very authoritative, but still one of the team and not overly nurturing, but very much a commander and a leader. He has a legacy in his films of incredible female characters. And I love that with this character, the woman can rescue the guy at the end. And usually, some, you know, I get a lot of scripts and in many cases, the man rescues the woman. And so how incredible to be part of Ridley's legacy where I get to play one of these warrior women in his films. My chest hurts. My character was kind of interesting. Like, how am I gonna be funny but kind of annoying at the same time. <laughs> so I'm like, I didn't have to search very far, but I'm like, I did have to search. Ah! He's hilarious. He's definitely, he's definitely the comedian of the group. Um, and I don't think he even tries. <laughs> I'm just so proud of you. <laughs> it's gotta be a very specific kind of humor. You know, it can't be, you know, like a like just a, a broad comedy. It's got to be humor within within the, the scene, within the drama, and also within the character, the reality of the characters. Good to run. Yes. Okay. Fuel pressure green. Engine alignment perfect. All of the astronauts are trained in every sort of area, but um, she's definitely the computer genius, I guess. Um, so I'm at my desk a lot, doing a lot of things that in real life I have no idea about. I understand why people think of Ridley first as a visual sort of genius, because he is. But the thing that does make him an actor's director is he has this trust in you as an actor and it gave me a sort of confidence to perform the way that I that I see the character and if he doesn't say anything about it then you can trust that you're doing your job right and that you are the right person for the job. Okay so from here go to like here like that. A lot of the character of Chris Beck I got from the book you know they refer to him as a doctor on the ship so to speak. But what I've decided to kind of, that he does is he's sort of like the flight surgeon, if you will. He has a background, like all of them do, have backgrounds in aerospace engineering. I always ask when I see astronauts, is because they have to give up so much of their lives. So I'm always wondering what makes these guys make that decision. I thought, okay, well, they've got to think of themselves as sort of the next Lewis and Clark, you know, the next sort of guys are going to push the boundary. I feel obliged to mention that setting up an explosive device in a spacecraft is a terrible, terrible idea. This is a dream crew for me. Kate Mara, Jessica Chastain, Michael Pena, Sebastian Stan, Matt Damon. It's a beautiful creative workspace where we are like collaborating and everybody takes each other seriously and we're here for each other like the astronauts are. NASA really couldn't have been more helpful. They were fantastic. And uh, Bert Ulrich, who's the head of um, PR and press and communications, put me in touch with absolutely everybody. So I had huge amounts of info and images that Ridley and I could discuss. Kind of as close as we can to being futuristic NASA. I said, what are your suits like? He said, well, what are your suits like? <laughs> he said, we like your suits. I said, all right. You mean they're going to be sexy? He said, well, yeah, ours are pretty not sexy. He said, oh, you go ahead, create what you like. We normally take ideas from films anyway. 
We have two spacesuits. One is what we call the surface suit, which was used for working on Mars. Janty turned up at my house a few months before we shot with, with all of these designs, and I, I have to say the suit is exactly as she designed it, and I loved it when she showed it to me in drawings, and, and I, love, I love the way it came out. It's really pretty comfortable, actually, given that it's skin tight, you know, and you got a lot of different bits and bobs on it. Regarding the surface suits, they are much more of a silhouette-based um, suit because Ridley wanted them to be very agile on the surface of Mars. Well, it's like a very, very thick, thick, thick wetsuit, basically. It's a little ungainly, but as long as you manage your comfort breaks throughout the day, you know, your water intake, um, you're fine. The spacesuits have gotten, I think, better over the years. You know, you put them on and there's a little backpack that's, that's blowing a little air in there. And if you don't get the tube right, then it gets pinched. And, and that's a bummer because you're, you're really aware instantly if there's not air. We wear this suit and it's made out of aeroprene. Everybody thinks it's neoprene, but it's not. It's aeroprene, so it's actually uh, uh, breathable. They've given us these um, and this, this T-shirt and you can plug this in and it sends iced water all around your torso. The second suit is the EVA, and that is the white doughboy suit, as Ridley likes to call them. The doughboy suit, which we're all familiar with, fundamentally hasn't changed that much because you're in a vacuum where you're fundamentally anywhere between minus 120 to minus 190. Um, and therefore your suit has to keep you absolutely, you'll be dead in a heartbeat. Ridley has always brings to every film such amazing vision and he didn't really want them as enormous as they are because they're very unwieldy. So we made them, we slenderized them and also he again wanted um, a helmet that would give them a lot more action with a lot less tech. According to the logs command, Lewis took it out, Sol 17, plugged it into the hab to recharge. It's been moved. Chuatel is playing Vincent Kapoor, who is one of the high ups at NASA. Certainly with Vincent Kapoor, he struck me as somebody who had a deep responsibility in terms of his work, but also a remarkable kind of iron will when it came to problem solving. I suppose with anything to do with space travel, there has to be this uh, absolute faith that you can prevail just by solving one problem at a time. And that was something I thought was quite powerful, uh, that, uh, that these scientific minds would approach life and saving a human life with uh, the skill set that they have. Chuatel is forthright, very forthright, but he is the alter ego. He definitely wants the job, and his boss is formidable. Uh, Jeff Daniels, who is, does not suffer fools, or doesn't suffer anybody, actually. And so he's perfect at that. 912 souls worth of food. We get there on 868. That's assuming nothing goes wrong. Teddy's got a tough job in that he has to kind of lead or corral a bunch of literally rocket scientists. Brilliant, every one of them, brilliant, brilliant people, but someone has to make the decision. So that's where Teddy comes in and uh, he relishes that. It's on me. You got your two weeks, get it done. Ridley works in a wonderful way in that he's prepared. As prepared as any director I've been with, storyboards that he does himself and he knows exactly what shots he's gonna use, what shots he doesn't need. There's a plan going in. And before every scene, he sits down with you and goes, here's what I'm thinking, you're here because you feel this way and that way, do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, that's his, yeah, 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 good point. Hadn't thought of that. And so then you, you find out where Ridley's point of view on the scene and the movie are, and then you go, all right, fit what I brought into that, go. He wants it to happen for the first time on camera, which is a lot of what the secret of filmmaking really is, or film acting anyway, it's make it happen for the first time. Action! You asked me how you did, and I'm giving you my answer. My answer is, eh. Kristen met with her as a very funny woman. 
And I, I never thought she'd want to do it, but she said, I really want to do this because I think she wants to spread her wings in terms of herself as an actress, and she was wonderful to work with. The cast is, um, <laughs> I was very intimidated <laughs> when I first showed up. With Chiwetel and, and Jeff and Mackenzie, so wonderful, and Sean. I can't believe that I'm here. It's great to be doing this kind of movie and to be in, you know, a mission control set. If Watney is really alive, we don't want the Ares 3 crew to know. What are we going to say? Dear America, remember that astronaut we killed and had a really nice funeral for? Uh, turns out he's alive and we left him on Mars. Our bad. Sincerely, NASA. We're sort of managing how a lot of other important people want to deal with the situation and ultimately she has to make the decision about how what the public is going to know and how we tell them. I thought it was a fantastic kind of en ensemble piece. The, the characters were very well drawn, very well thought out, and, uh, and, and very funny, you know, that's what kind of uh, attracted me quite a lot, the humour and the kind of deadpan uh, expressions and, uh, and, and kind of behaviour that these, the, the, these characters exhibit. The Mitch character in NASA is Sean Bean, who is playing someone probably who was a pilot I didn't make, you know, astronaut, but instead hooked into the other aspects of it, the backup to NASA and the understanding pilots and what they have to do and what they have to put up with. Director of Mars Missions for NASA. Andy had done such an amazing job of setting up this ensemble of very disparate characters. We're all experts in the field. I think what that allowed us to do was to really hone in on actors that could fit those specialties. And building that ensemble was really just... It was amazing, it was like watching a photograph develop. This particular team from the Hermes to Mark Watney to NASA to JPL, they, I had one of the better times and the better experiences with the actors. It was all good fun and because of that it helps and you move like lightning. that is. That Armenian? Oh, me. Okay. That's gotta go in there. Hi kids. Uh, this is Mark Watney, astronaut. Um, we're about six hours before our launch here on the Hermes and I've been asked by the good folks at NASA to introduce you to some of our crewmates here, uh, which I'm happy to do. So, hello Earthlings, uh, Mark Watney here. I'm your personal guide on this tour of the Hermes. Astronaut again. <laughs> this is pilot Rick Martinez doing the pre-flight checks. As you can see, he's using some pretty sophisticated math to get us to Mars. You got enough fingers there, Rick? Just balancing my checkbook. Hi there, I am Commander Melissa Lewis. Dr. Chris Beck, flight surgeon. Uh, my name is Alex Vogel. I am a German astronaut. I'm Beth Johansson, the computer expert. That's it. I'm psyched about going to Mars. Thanks. That's a hell of an answer to the entire world. Uh, Gentlemen, why don't you tell the viewers what's cooking? Yolk uh, something. Chewy. And you, Herr Vogel? Sausage. Uh, German? Wurst. It's awesome. Hello, Commander. Big year ahead. Maybe you could tell us what inspired you to take it all on. Uh, sure. Laura Clark, Chris McAuliffe, and, uh, of course, Eileen Collins. And you're not going to get a better answer than that. Seriously, though, Rick, how do we get there? Well, you basically point the bird in that direction. You wait. 150 days and 36 million miles later, we should be at Mars. Oh, wait. No, that's Uranus. Okay, that's Mars. Hey, you know, don't, don't believe a word they say. You're one of the good ones. Thanks. Hey, wait, what? Who says that about me? 
This isn't over, you and me. We're gonna talk later. Mm-hmm. All right. Everyone, just a few minutes now before we leave for Mars. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your tour of the Hermes and see what a stellar crew we have. Say goodbye, crew. Goodbye, goodbye crew. Uh, everyone's a comedian. All right, we, we want to say goodbye. We want to wish everybody here on Earth an amazing year while we're gone. Let's go, Cubs. Uh, actually, how about, how about holding off on winning that world title till I'm back on Earth? Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Shut up. Martinez is a Yankee fan. Anyway, have a, have a wonderful year. Uh, just remember, what we do up there, we're, we're doing for everyone here on Earth. This is going to be an amazing journey for all of us. We're all in this together. Uh, Mom, Dad, love you. I'll miss you. And uh, first thing we do when we get back is uh, go to Gino's for some deep dish. All right. Watney out. That political bullshit was going to get Mark Watney killed. November 2035, the world was stunned when NASA director Teddy Sanders announced I I that astronaut Mark Watney was killed. However, that shock was nothing compared to the further revelation that Watney was alive and stranded. In the coming months, the world united to bring Watney home. But what the world didn't know is that while NASA was working around the clock to find a solution, debates about how to save Watney had created a sharp divide that threatened rescue efforts. In time, this split would end one man's career, threaten more, and lead to a near catastrophic breakdown in the chain of command. Tonight, you'll hear this untold story of the Ares III rescue from the people who were there and the man who risked it all for what he believed was right. This is Mitch Henderson, former flight director for Hermes. Outspoken and direct, Henderson earned a reputation for being a straight shooter fair but difficult he's also been accused of rubbing some people the wrong way i'll be the first to admit this was a bad situation for everyone involved i mean this whole thing was just insane nasa the organization that plans for everything i'd never planned for this 90 percent of being an astronaut is readiness training imagine a scenario find a solution and drill and drill until you can solve it in your sleep but no one predicted or even imagined that a piece of antenna would break off in a f***ing storm, impale an astronaut, cause an evac, and then leave one of our guys stranded 140 million miles away. So instead of focusing solely on getting Mark home, things went to shit. We got dragged into political manoeuvring from the get-go. What was the public gonna think? How should we break the news to the press? And when we thought he was dead, we couldn't even search for his body without finding a congressional budget angle. What kind of bureaucratic shit is that? Man down, that's our priority. And I was gonna do everything in my power to make sure it stayed our priority. Even if it meant disobeying a direct order, even if it meant the end of my career. This was about Mark, nothing else. On November 13th, Dr. Theodore Sanders received the call he never wanted. They lost an astronaut under his command. It was late when I uh, got the call. Most of the country was sound asleep. Meanwhile, in some remote corner of the solar system, this man had given his life in the pursuit of something that he always loved, or so we thought. After dealing with my immediate duties, I booked the first flight to Chicago because I'll be damned if the parents were going to hear about this on television. We all took the news hard. No one ever wants to have that happen. You know, we're all in this together. Mark was always in great spirits, but uh, he, he was <laughs> an absolute troublemaker. But you couldn't help but love the guy. He 
He's the type of guy that could uplift team morale in a snap. We were amazed and uh, overjoyed when we learned that Watney had survived. Then reality quickly sank in. We'd have to mount a rescue mission to Mars. Only had one ship, and it was heading back to Earth. So we immediately got to work trying to figure out how we're gonna pull this off while making sure that we kept the rest of the crew safe. I understand the intense emotions of the situation, but that was even more reason to remain calm and collected. That's why we decided to not inform the crew that Mark was alive. I mean, you want to talk about keeping the crew safe? Well, how about not letting them spend six months on the Hermes, thinking their friend and colleague had just died and left his body on Mars? Look, I'm not... I'm not totally insensitive to his point of view. But you have to understand, this particular crew was like a family. From day one, they just, they meshed and it made things, made things complicated. We, that is Teddy and myself, felt like we'd be doing more harm than good by telling them that Mark was in fact alive. And we're talking about an elite team of pilots, scientists, doctors, former military officers trained to confront some of the most dangerous situations known to mankind. And they deserve our complete trust and faith. We owe them the benefits of having all the facts that we have on the ground. There's a shocker, Mitch Henderson's complaining. Here's the thing, we still had to figure out how to feed Mark. And Henderson's ranting wasn't doing anything to solve that. So I chose to ignore him and focus on the immediate problem, how to keep Mark from starving to death. But what Teddy didn't realize is that I wasn't the only person pissed off. I was just the only one saying something about it. But behind closed doors, people were talking. With an extremely limited supply of food, Mark Watney's situation became more dire with each passing day. NASA had to rush production of a supply probe to ensure Mark Watney would have the rations he needed to survive on Mars. However, with time running out, Director Teddy Sanders was forced to make a dangerous decision, one that almost cost Watney his life. Yeah, so Teddy decided to bypass testing and inspections on the probe because he was under pressure to deliver the world some good news. We missed something and Food pro went kaboom. It was devastating. There's really no other word for how I felt that day. When I saw that thing blow up, I thought that was it. I thought I had just condemned Mark Watney to a death sentence. He was gonna starve to death, millions of miles away from home, and I was the reason. Teddy realized he had to protect himself as much as the crew. And with the whole world watching, he wasn't gonna do anything remotely risky again. And whatever nerve he had, he lost that day. Pardon my language, but that's bullshit. I don't have the luxury of shooting from the hip and being a cowboy. Accountability has to stop with somebody. And that's what he didn't get. You can call it self-preservation if you like, doesn't matter, it's just, it's just how things are. And at the end of the day, somebody has to take responsibility for all these decisions, and that's me. I gambled, I lost. No more gambling. Protecting the crew of the Hermes became my top priority. I had no other choice. Oh, is it, there's always another choice. And Teddy and his lackeys were clueless about the growing descent. They had no idea that our faction existed and was actively exploring other options. We were plan B. Tell you about Rich Purnell. Um, where do I begin? Rich Purnell is um, a weird kid. Um, <clears throat> he's not quite living in the same world as you and me. And I say that as a compliment, but he's so lost in his own 
world that sometimes he lacks what people might call um, a people skills. Rich rules. I mean, seriously, this guy is everything you want from an astrodynamicist. Obsessive, focused, irreverent, without any hint of a political agenda at all. While everyone else was busy trying to come up with a diplomatic solution to the situation, Purnell poured himself into the math like a madman. I mean, he even took his vacation so he could ignore his other work and focus solely on our Watney problem. He had this crazy idea. Um, instead of docking the Hermes, what if we slingshot it around the Earth and hurtle it back at Mars where the crew could rendezvous with Mark? This kid I'd never seen before, he waltzes into my office like he owns it. He makes me hold a stapler, starts running around me like one of my grandkids playing with a toy jet. Honest to God, I thought the team was pranking me. I promptly kicked Rich out. Turns out the kid was the real deal. He had this preposterous maneuver. It was brilliant thinking, but it, you know, it was a plan that would jeopardize every astronaut I had in space and likely bring about the end of the Ares program. Decades of work, a second space race, two successful trips to Mars, and now they want me to risk it all. And Mitch couldn't fathom why I'd say no. I, I get it just fine. I mean, he made the smart choice for the politics of it, but this wasn't his call. Lewis was commanding Hermes. This was her mission and her decision. That was that. Teddy shelved the Pernell maneuver without a moment's hesitation. He just wasn't counting on what happened next. You know, no one was. That's when the faction finally decided it was time to ignore Teddy and put Plan B into action. After scrapping the Purnell maneuver, Teddy Sanders issued a mandate barring anyone from informing the crew of this option. Henderson had enough. Henderson and the other members of the faction held a secret meeting to plan the leak. Comprised of coders and key positions in mission control, they figured out how to get the plans to the crew with no one knowing. How many others? Well, that's between me and them. <laughs> However, even outside our group, there were quite a few others sympathetic to our cause and no one stepped in to stop us or told Teddy. I think that says it all. Once we confirmed Hermes had the plans, I tracked down Annie Montrose. I wanted to give her the heads up. As the public face of NASA, she was the one who was going to have to explain this to the public. I wanted to make sure if things went south, she'd be ready to keep Teddy from doing anything really stupid. I always suspected it was bigger than Mitch. A lot of layers to what we do. It won't be easy for one person to bypass all the hurdles required to transmit such a message to the Hermes. Well, I always knew there was more to this. After all, Mitch could barely figure out the company email, let alone hide a secret message. I think Darth Vader is just mad I snuck the plans out of the Death Star. <laughs> Mitch got lucky. Things worked out for the best. He didn't have to worry about what would have happened if they didn't. I would have been the one to take responsibility, the responsibility for the loss of lives, the ship, his leak. Everything was on me. I mean, Teddy can make this about himself all he wants, but I, I didn't tell the crew to defy Teddy or disobey any order. I simply provided them with information. And the crew decided to save Mark. I mean, they had no desire to play safe or protect Teddy's career and think about the burdens of his job. Mark was the priority, just as it should have been all along. And to them, the risk was absolutely worth it. Against all odds, the Purnell maneuver proved to be a success, and Ares III was able to bring Watney home. As the world celebrated, the events of the leak were still playing out. Mitch Henderson was asked to resign. The Ares III crew received a hero's welcome, and Annie Montrose advised Sanders against disciplining the crew for their actions. In the end, only Henderson would pay the price. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. I've no regrets. 
Today, every member of that crew is alive and well. If we had waited, then who knows? Personally, I don't think Mark would have made it without the crew's decision to go back when they did. My opinion on Teddy's choice? <laughs> well, sure, you know, some people thought we were leaving Watney out to dry. But minimizing risk is what NASA does. That's what they never understood. Mark Watney was a person, not a risk to be minimized. But Kapoor never met an opinion he didn't like. I don't think he's ever taken a hard stand on anything. It's perfect for his new job. Teddy is a good leader. And I don't envy having to be in this position. But now, I completely understand why he chose what he did. However, I also understand why someone like Mitch Henderson did what he did. It's definitely a hand you can only play once. And it's not something you can come back from. Now, nearly seven years later, the full story has surfaced. But it's a much different world for all involved. Teddy Sanders retired after Ares 5, which paved the way for Vincent Kapoor to take his place as director of NASA. Annie Montrose also climbed the ranks to oversee the communications office as its new director. After a brief retirement, Mitch Henderson went to work in the private sector as a consultant for industry startups. I retired because I was exhausted. And so far, retirement's been amazing. I watch football, I take long walks with my dog, I watch more football. But, uh, best of all, I, uh, I get to be with my family every day. And I don't have to worry about every decision I make might get somebody killed. Or, way more stressful than it sounds. I don't know that I'll ever retire. Uh, space will always be in my blood. As a member of multiple advisory boards, it's not a full-time commitment. I get to travel and sit in a room and tell people my opinions and then leave. Perfect for someone like me. Hard feelings? No, I, I actually respect Mitch for being Mitch. You never have to wonder with that guy. I mean, that, that's something that can be just as fantastic as it can be frustrating. We actually play golf sometimes. Yeah, it's true. We meet up a few times a year to have a go at it, but he's terrible. <laughs> I mean, you'd think a man who ran NASA would understand trajectory better. Ask him uh, when's the last time he won. <laughs> he cheats. That's all I'm saying.